All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. So it is um, Thursday, May 30th, 2019, and we're live. Hope everybody's doing well today. So everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. So you heard me talk about this topic before dealing with um, lessons, dealing with slavery uh, in the classroom, in schools, in middle schools, high schools, gone bad, okay? And I talked about this uh, specific story back in, uh, I think it was March of uh, 2019. And this deals with a uh, affluent uh, Lutheran school that has uh, students that are pre-kindergarten through eighth grade in Bronxville, uh, New York, which is about 15 miles north of Manhattan, okay? And it, um, so in, in this case here, uh, you had a mock slave auction that uh, a white female teacher uh, conducted for about two minutes or so to teach a history about slavery, okay? Now you've seen a number of my broadcasts I've done in the past dealing with how uh, these things are harmful to our children, all right? And everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in, and African American business owners post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. So this story made national news, and I'm gonna uh, recap what happened with this uh, with this case. And then um, it, the update to the story just came out on Wednesday, May 29th. Uh, now, as I reported before, the state attorney general's office, uh, state attorney general for the state of New York is Letitia James, African-American woman, Letitia James. And they launched an investigation into this case. And what they, uh, so uh, their findings came out. Uh, I saw an article from uh, NBCnews.com on uh, Wednesday, May 29th. So their findings have come out. And what they have found is what I told you back in March and April when I did broadcast dealing with this and other um, cases of slave uh, things, uh, slave lessons in schools gone wrong. When you have reenactments like this, dealing with slavery, it um, harms the African American students and it can harm the other students that are there in the class also, okay? As well as those in the school when uh, people find out what happened. And this is what happened in this case uh, here. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk about this. All right, and then also we'll let you know about the uh, the new online course that I have uh, dealing with the history of uh, the transatlantic slave trade. We have that starting up June 8th, 2019. It's an online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach in School. This is uh, a eight-week, 16-hour uh, online course you can watch from around the world. It'll be archived and we'll deal with thousands of years of history, okay? So that um, we'll let you know about that as well. All right, so let's look at the story from NBCnews.com and also I'll reference the, um, the online study, that, I'll reference the 52-page study that you hear me talk about a lot called Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery. And uh, it's this study right here from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And this study documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools across the country. Uh, and it documents ways to more correctly teach the history of slavery. So you can get this from uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, splcenter.org, splcenter.org, Teaching Hard History American Slavery, okay? So I hope everybody's doing well. We have Patricia, uh, uh, Arkea, uh, John, uh, just a few of the people watching. 
All right, so let's look at the story from uh, this update in the story that I covered back in March of 2019 from, um, let's look at this update from NBCnews.com. Name of this article, Black Students Were Cast as Slaves in New York Teachers Mock Auctions State Fines. Black Students Were Cast as Slaves in New York teacher in New York Teachers Mock uh, Auctions State Fines. A private school uh, teacher in Westchester County, Westchester County, placed imaginary chains on black students' necks, wrists, and ankles and urged white classmates to bid on them. Okay, now in all fairness, uh, the teacher's name is Rebecca uh, Antonozzi. Now I dealt with this uh, back then, and in all fairness, also I'm going to uh, uh, share an interview uh, that uh, a local news affiliate, News uh, News 12 in Westchester, um, did with her for her to explain what happened. Because when I first heard the story, as I talked about before, when I first heard the story, you know, I was like, this is crazy what's going on. But when I heard her explain it, even though to have the slave reenactment was still wrong, to have the mock slave auction was still wrong, um, when I heard her explain it, I got a better understanding of what took place. So uh, mock slave auctions at a private school in Bronxville, New York, in which white students were urged by a fifth grade teacher to bid on black classmates, quote, had a profoundly negative effect on the children a state investigation found. Okay, now in her telling of the story, and then also I read the official statement from the uh, state's attorney general office. In, in that statement, it did not say that the white students were, uh, I don't think it said the white students were encouraged to or bid on the black children, all right? But I'm sharing, sharing the article with you. Okay, so the New York State Attorney General's office on Wednesday, May 29th, announced its findings in the probe into the students in March of 2019 at the Chapel School and said the school has agreed to diversify its staff and student body, diversify its staff and student body. Now the school enrolled students in pre-kindergarten through eighth grade, 43% of the students are quote unquote minorities according to the school, all right? Now annual tuition at the school costs up to $14,000 a year, and it is an affluent uh, private school there in uh, Bronxville, New York, okay, which is uh, north of Manhattan. All right, now, uh, as part of the agreement, the school must hire a chief diversity officer approved by State Attorney General Leti uh, Letitia James. Quote, uh, now, Letitia, uh, Attorney General, State's Attorney General Letitia James said in the statement, quote, every young person, regardless of race, deserves the chance to attend, uh, to attend school free of harassment, bias, and discrimination. Lessons designed to separate children on the basis of race have no place in New York, class, in New York, New York classrooms or in classrooms throughout this country. I thank the Chapel School for agreeing to take measures that directly address the issues of race, diversity, and inclusion at the school, end quote. Now, in March of 2019, the mother of a student at the school uh, in Westchester County, uh, about 15 miles north of Manhattan, said a white teacher allowed white students to bid on and buy black students who were to pretend to be slaves. Now, uh, State's Attorney General Letitia James said Wednesday that her office's investigation found that in two separate fifth grade social studies classes, a teacher asked all of the African-American students to raise their hands and then instructed them to exit the classroom and stand in the hallway. The teacher then placed imaginary chains or shackles on the students' necks, wrists, and ankles and had them walk back into the classroom. At that point, the teacher instructed the African-American students to line up uh, against the wall and then proceeded to conduct a simulated uh, auction or slave auction of the African-American students in front of the rest of the class. Quote, the investigation found that the teacher's reenactments in the two classes had a profoundly negative effect on all of the students present. 
especially the African American students, especially the African American students, and the school com and the school community at large. Uh, New York State's Attorney General Letitia James said. She went on to say, quote, following the reenactments, the school terminated the teacher's employment, end quote. Now, the investigation further revealed prior parental complaints to school administrators about the school's uh, alleged lack of racial sensitivity and found that the school did not take sufficient steps to address the complaints, okay? Uh, uh, Letitia James said as well. Quote, the investigation found that families had previously made complaints relating to, among other things, unequal discipline of students on the basis of race, a lack of racial sensitivity, and awareness in school curricula and a lack of diversity among the teaching faculty, all right? Now, under the agreement, the school must develop and submit a staff diversification plan for increasing, uh, quote unquote, minority representation among faculty and retain a diversity consultant for help, uh, for help educating students and school employees about racial and ethnic diversity in the educational setting, okay? There was a long list of uh, things that the school is going to enact now. Now, additionally, the school is required to create a formal complaint procedure for students or parents to uh, report harassment or discrimination. The school, uh, the chapel school, told NBC News on Wednesday, May 29th, that it, quote, took immediate corrective action, end quote, after the March 5th, 2019 incident. Principal Michael Schultz said the school accepts responsibility for the state's findings and is committed to implementing its agreement. Now, uh, in the statement, uh, it, it said, quote, the chapel school reached a timely resolution with the attorney general to ensure that our focus remains on the well-being of our community as we move forward in continued reflection action and growth end quote the school said all right so that's that's the article from nbcnews.com from may 29 2019 which is an update on this story that i covered in uh, uh march and april of 2019 as well all right so i said i will you know keep up on these types of stories i've reported on other stories as well dealing with this you know i did the uh broadcast dealing with how schools keep teaching slavery and civil rights history in ways that traumatize African-American students. We talked about that in April of 2019. Vox.com had an article dealing with this. And a lot of these articles, not the one from NBC News, but when we look at these articles on Vox.com, they talk about, once again, this study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLcenter.org, SPLcenter.org, called Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery. And this is a 52 page study that you can download. And I took it to the printer, got it printed up, okay? And this study, once again, documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools across the country and how teachers are many times ill-equipped to teach the history of slavery. And one of the things that uh, this study did was it did a survey of 1,000 12th graders across the country. And one of the things that they found is that only 8% of, uh, of 12th graders or high school seniors, only 8% knew that slavery was the central reason why the Civil War was fought. Only 8% uh, knew this. 68% um, of high school seniors surveyed did not know that it took a constitutional amendment, the 13th Amendment, uh, to formally end chattel slavery. So. This study uh, is good for people who do homeschooling. When I teach, this is something that I incorporate in my lectures, et cetera. Um, when I do my online course uh, starting June 8th, uh, 2019, uh, the Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, this is one of the things that, that uh, uh, one of the sources that uh, will, will utilize in the online course also okay uh for more information about the online course you can email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com we'll send you some information because i'm getting the uh the uh, link together for it so uh, you'll be able to start registering for that today
Okay, it's a uh, eight week online course. It uh, mainly meets on Saturdays. We'll do about 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. It's gonna be a total of 16 hours. And um, you can watch it over and over again, watch from around the world. It's gonna be um, $80 uh, for, the, for the entire course. And we will cover about We'll cover archaeological discoveries. We'll cover um, thousands of years of history, and uh, uh, well, it'll include about fifty recent news articles, also. Okay, so it's going to be a deep, deep class. The last time I ran this class was in uh, September two thousand seventeen. So there have been a lot of new archaeological discoveries since then that we uh, have to uh, talk about, like the Clotilda slave ship. But um, archaeological discoveries going back tens of thousands of years as well. They also deal with the African presence in this country, uh, going back thousands of years, and. Uh, uh, archaeological discoveries we have seen in India, Morocco, et cetera, all right? Okay, so email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com uh, for more information on the uh, online course, all right? And then also African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast, and uh, we'll let you know how you can advertise uh, with the African History Network also. All right, so I, I want to go to this uh, brief interview that. Uh, Channel 12 in Westchester did with uh, Rebecca Antonosi. And this deals with, um, she was the teacher who had the mock slave auction, all right? And uh, I want you to hear from her exactly what happened. I absolutely not, would never ever put chains on them. Well, this local social studies teacher defending herself over accusations of staging a mock slave auction at okay? an elite private school in Westchester. That story aired here on 12 and made international headlines. Now, this white teacher accused of lining up African-American students and staging this mock slave auction. Well, tonight that teacher is breaking her silence to News 12's Tara Rosenberg. How did you feel when you saw your name and slave auction in a headline that circled the globe? I have not been able to function, um, and I couldn't even look at the words on the paper because I know what was true, and I know my intentions is to never hurt or offend or upset anyone. The Westchester private school teacher making international headlines after being accused of taking a history lesson on slavery too far is speaking out for the first time. I've been getting panic attacks, waking up in the middle of the night. The firestorm ignited after a parent accused fifth grade teacher Rebecca Antonazzi of staging a mock slave auction two weeks ago inside her classroom at the chapel school in Bronxville, in which black students she claimed were placed in imaginary chains while white students bid on them. Point blank, did you hold a mock slave auction in your classroom? Absolutely not, it was a false accusation. Antonazzi insists her goal was simply to bring history alive to an inquisitive classroom learning all about colonial America. So we were reading the sentence that said um, indentured servants and slaves were taken against their will. And one of my students said, this is very unfair. How can they be taken against their will? Well, what do you mean? Can you show us? Absolutely. I said, okay, how many of you are African-American? They raised their hands. I said, okay, go line up the door for me, please. So they lined up by the door. I said, if you were living during this time, you would be treated unfairly and brought to the new world against your will and forced to work. And basically what would happen is they would say, okay, who, uh, let's, let's bid 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Okay, great. Males, sit down. You're working in the field. Females, sit down you're working in the domestic household. And that was literally under two minutes. Two minutes that would catapult the Tony private school and Antonazzi into crisis mode. My principal did to call me last week and he said that we love you as a teacher, you're employed, we just want to diffuse the situation, talk to the parents, and you'll be back at school in the classroom doing what you love. And unfortunately that did not happen. What happened? Um, I got a call last night from my lawyers saying that unfortunately they terminated my position. Um, teaching is not a profession for me. It is with my life. I teach with my heart and anyone that knows me knows that I have no ill intentions. But Antonazzi says support from the community has started to pour in. I have over 50 references right now from parents 
who know me, and some of them are now speaking out. She's not capable of something like that based on the person that we know, given her nature, sweet, kind, loving, and she treats all kids with uh, respect, regardless of their skin pigmentation. And it's praise like that, Antonazzi says, is carrying her through the most difficult chapter of her life. I just want to be able to get past this. Tara Rosenblum, News 12. Thank you, Tara. Now, Antonazzi has hired a lawyer and may file a lawsuit. The Chapel School, meanwhile, hired a New York City public relations firm who told us tonight an internal investigation is underway with the goal of creating a long-term action plan to tackle racial sensitivity. All right. So that was um, that was from March 18th, 2019. That is uh, an article entitled, I Teach With My Heart, Teacher Pushes Back Amid Slavery Lesson Firestorm. That is from um, Westchester.news. That's from uh, News 12 in Westchester, New York. Okay. Westchester dot news 12.com we'll post a link here on the thread of the broadcast you can see the uh you can read the entire article in the interview that you just heard is in that article okay so that's what happened now when i talked about this uh back in march and april i talked about the fact that um one if teachers and if the schools require teachers to read this this study they would not have done the slave reenactment because it tells you in the study that slave reenactments don't work and they are harmful to the children, especially African-American children, number one. So they tell you this in the study. This is a free study. Now, I don't understand how is it, how is it I know about this study and the educators with the master's degrees and the PhDs and the principals, they don't know about this study. I don't understand that, okay? Once again, it's at uh, splcenter.org, Southern Poverty Law Center. Teaching Hard History, American Slavery, Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. And I'll post a link here uh, to the study also. So you can read it. This is a PDF of the study. You can read it. You can download it. You can take it to, take it to the printer if you want to. Get it printed up because uh, it's uh, a lot to print. It's like 52 pages. Not, a much, not as much as the Mueller report. That's why I bought I had bought the Mueller report from uh, the Washington Post. This was 10 bucks, okay? Because this is 448 pages plus some additional information from the Washington Post. All right, so how's everybody doing? Uh, Carl, Lonnie, uh, Joel, and just a few of the people watching. All right, so I'm going to uh, uh, go to, uh, I'm going to look at uh, the statement from the Attorney General in just a minute and deal with uh, some of the, the, the agreement. OK, because there were a number of things in the agreement between the attorney general's office of New York and the chapel school uh, to address this issue and, few, and and previous issues that have come up as well. OK, so uh, we'll go to that in just a minute. But very quickly, I want to let you know, you know, African-American business owners, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can uh, advertise with the African History Network. OK. But uh, we have a new advertiser, and that is uh, Mercedes Waffles and More. Mercedes Waffles and More. Now, they are a uh, catering uh, business only, and they service uh, the uh, New Jersey area and also New York City. Uh, visit their website, MercedesWafflesAndMore.com, MercedesWafflesAndMore.com. And they want people to come together and have good food that tastes good and feels good for you. All right. so. Uh, Mercedes Waffles and More offers the ultimate comfort food, all right? It's soul food, but it's made with uh, vegan and vegetarian ingredients. So it's soul food made with vegan, vegan and vegetarian ingredient, ingredients, so it's much healthier for you. Their food provides that home-cooked meal uh, feeling while being uh, mindful of each person's uh, nutritional needs. Okay. So they, uh, Mercedes Waffles and more will have a booth at the multicultural festival, the multicultural festival in New York city, taking place June 1st, 2019. Uh, they will be there 11 AM to 5 PM and also visit their website for more information, Mercedes Waffles and more. Now everybody remembers the song about pebbles, right? Do you want to ride in my Mercedes boy? Right. And that, and that, you know, I was seeing the song, do you want to ride in my Mercedes girl, even though I don't have a Mercedes, but still, you know, you know, still. All right. Um, 
But check check out that website, Mercedes Waffles and More. Look out for them at the Multicultural Festival in New York City, June 1st, 2019. And African American business owners, email us at customer service at African History Network.com. Customer service at African History Network.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. We have a few spots left. Our current promotion get two months for the price of one. Okay. All right. So let's continue here. Uh, let's go and look at, I read the, um, I went to the state attorney general's website, uh, Letitia James, and they have a, uh, in the article from NBC news, there's a link to the official statement from the attorney general's office. All right. And it lays out, I'll post a link here, uh, on the thread also. So you can read this as well. And it also, explains the agreement that the attorney general's office came to with the school all right and a lot of times people don't understand uh this is an example of how politics impacts every aspect of our life the attorney general's office letitia james is an african-american woman got involved in this and i reported on this uh before when i covered this story there was a uh, there was an article from nbcnews.com back in uh March, let me see, where is that article? It was one from uh, NBC News back in March. Uh, teachers allege mock slave auction in fifth grade class prompts AG response. Attorney General, teachers alleged mock slave auction in fifth grade class prompts AG response. Okay, the reports of racist. Uh, lessons by a teacher at the chapel school are deeply troubling, said New York Attorney General Letitia James. My office is monitoring this matter closely. All right. So that was uh, March of, March 11th, 2019 from NBCnews.com. OK, so the agreement entered between the attorney general and the school requires that the school do the following. One, hire a chief diversity officer subject to the attorney general's approval Two, develop and submit a staff diversification plan proposing steps the school will take uh, annually to increase minority representation among the school's teaching faculty. Okay, three, commit, uh, commit new financial aid to man maintain and increase diversity within the student body. Four, submit a new code of conduct. Submit a new code of conduct, conduct subject to the Attorney General's approval governing all school community members and uh, specific, uh, specifically uh, addressing racial and ethnic uh, discrimination and harassment, as well as other prohibited behaviors, okay? Uh, six, identify and retain a, a diversity consultant to assist the school and developing training protocols to train students and school employees on racial, ethnic diversity and sensitivity in the educational setting with training to follow no less than two, uh, no less than twice per academic year. OK, uh, so that is, I think, seven, which they number these damn things. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's six. Number seven, create a formal complaint procedure that students or parents may use to notify the uh, school of complaints regarding harassment or discrimination and publicize the new procedure to uh, school community members. Okay, and uh, eight, maintain records of complaints, investigations of complaints, and the implementation of other elements of relief in the agreement, okay? Maintain records of complaints, investigations of complaints, and the implementation of other elements of relief in the agreement. All right, now this matter is being handled by Assistant Attorney General Justin uh, Diebler, D-E-A-B-L-E-R, I guess it's pronounced Diebler, of the Civil Rights Bureau under the supervision of Acting Bureau Chief um, Elena, uh, 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 Elena Goldstein. The Bureau is part of the Division of Social Justice, which is led by Chief Deputy Attorney General uh, Megan uh, uh, Fox, F-A-U-X, okay, or Fo or Fox. All right, so that is from the uh, State Attorney General for the State of New York, Letitia James, from her office. 
and we posted the link here uh, so you can read that full statement as well. Now, a lot of people say, well, black people need to have their own schools and we need to homeschool our children and all of that. You know, I'm all OK and I'm all for that. I uh, am an advocate of homeschooling, but I also know that there are millions of African-American children in schools across the country and all of our parents are not going to homeschool. All of our children are not going to be part of a homeschooling network to deliver their, the, their primary education, to deliver the majority of their education. But the majority of African-American children are going to be in public schools. I understand this. Every year, third weekend in July, I'm one of the presenters at the Liberated Minds Black Home School and Education Expo in Atlanta. I'll be there again this, uh, uh, I'll be there again in July, third weekend in July, 2019. I'm one of the presenters, I'm one of the vendors. I'm a big advocate of homeschooling African-American children, but I'm also realistic, and I know that the majority of African-American children are not going to be primarily homeschooled. So you also have to deal with the public schools. You also have to deal with the private schools. You also have to deal with the charter schools, okay? And all this deals with policies. It deals with laws as well. So I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not one that's unrealistic. It's unrealistic to think that all black children are going to be homeschooled. That ain't, that, that's not going to happen. I'll tell you that right now. That's not going to happen. All right. So when we look at, um, okay, we have Wilson, we have William. Um, there's a few of the people watching. William said, now this, sound, now this sounds good for a plan. I hope there is follow-up. We must check on the government. All right. Then also, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network as well. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Or visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button at our website. Also, you can set it up for a recurring donation if you want to. If you want to donate 10, 15, 25, 50, 100 or more, you can do that. That helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air pay for all this paper that I print up, finance our Sunday night show, the African History Network show, okay? And it helps when I have to travel to different events, like uh, I will be speaking at the uh, big Juneteenth celebration in Atlanta, June 14th through the 16th. So I'll be in June and I'll be in Atlanta in June and in July. So I'll be speaking. Uh, it's uh, Friday through Sunday. They have about 100 vendors there. There's thousands of people that come through during the weekend. Just talked to Bob Johnson last night, who is the uh, organizer of the um, event. So I'll be speaking, I guess, on Saturday. But I'll be a vendor there all three days as well. OK. And they usually hold that at Mosley Park in Atlanta. I have to get the, uh, we'll post the link here on the thread of the broadcast and get the flyer on our website also, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, so if we look at the article from uh, Vox.com that I've talked about before, now this one came out in March of 2019. Um, well, well, let's see, uh, this one is American schools can't figure out how to teach kids about slavery. American schools can't figure out how to teach kids about slavery. All right. And this one uh, and they had another article that came out in April. Of uh, April 19th, 2019, schools keep teaching slavery and civil rights history in ways that traumatize black students. Schools keep teaching slavery and civil rights history in ways that traumatize black students. So if you follow us on the African History Network, our Facebook fan page, the African History Network or on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, you've heard me talk about uh, all this before, all right? And I'm updating you on this story that I first covered back in uh, March of 2019. But uh, in this article here from Vox.com, March 13, 2019, American schools can't figure out how to teach kids uh, about slavery. They talk about Rebecca Antonozzi and the Chapel School in Bronxville, New York, okay? They also uh, talk about how, um, uh, coming just weeks after the end of a particularly insulting Black History Month, uh, marked by uh, similar controversies in other schools. We saw a number of examples of uh, history lessons gone wrong in, uh, uh, in, in schools, okay? And let me see here. Is this the right, let me look at this here. Is this the right one? Okay. I'm trying to find this link here that they're that they're referencing. Just give me a second. Okay, New York Daily News. 
and I wanted to pull up this link here dealing with uh, Black History Month, just a second here. And they take this out. This is the right article. Hold on, American Schools. Okay, because I have this printed up as well. Okay. All right, but in, in this article that I printed up, they go on to say that coming just weeks after the end of a particularly insulting Black History Month marked by similar controversies in other schools, the story of the alleged uh, classroom mock auction fits into a broader pattern of ill-conceived or outright offensive classroom simulations about slavery. Ill-conceived or outright offensive classroom simulations about slavery, okay? And what, what they oftentimes talk about is how a lot of these lessons are insensitive to African-American students. Once again, they didn't read this study. Okay, if Rebecca Antonosi had read this study, she would have known not to do slave, not to do slave reenactments, and she would still have her job today. Okay, and this is something that school districts need to use this study. The, uh, it should be mandatory in the schools that the teachers read this study who are uh, teaching history. Okay, because if they did, a lot of these stories that we see about uh, the mock slave auctions. You had uh, you had one story dealing with a, a, a monopoly-like role-playing game called Escaping Slavery, Escaping Slavery. This was, this was used in Wilmington, North Carolina. That's something else that I talked about as well. Okay, you, you just had a teacher, uh, you just had a gym teacher who did a, who had a lesson dealing with uh, games that children play, like ethnic games that children play and this teacher said that they were going to help um, the, the, the African-American students research slave games, okay? Uh, this was in Wisconsin, okay? In April of 2019, you had a physical education teacher in Wisconsin who allegedly asked black seventh graders to research how to play slave games, okay? The schools have apologized and placed teachers on leave in other cases, uh, yeah, so, so, okay, so that, so that was one case there in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin, okay? All right, but collectively these, these incidents reveal just how bad American schools still are at educating uh, students about slavery and how it has shaped American history, okay? And let's see here, let's go. All right, so that, that's a problem and not just because students aren't getting an adequate education. Poor lessons, um, let me see if I can pull this up. Okay, poor lessons about slavery in schools also make it harder for people to see how the impacts of enslavement continue to affect black communities in the present. Let me repeat that. Poor lessons about slavery in schools also make it harder for people to see how the impacts of enslavement continue to affect black communities in the present. Okay, there, there, there have been plenty of examples of highly questionable uh, lessons about slavery in schools. Okay, so we saw uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina, the es Escaping Slavery board game. It was a monopoly light -like board game called Escaping Slavery. You had a grandparent of an African American child at the school who argued that the game was offensive, noting that it included cartoon images of shackles and enslaved families. One part of the game required students to use a freedom uh, punch card, a freedom punch card. And the, um, this was a grandmother uh, whose grandchild attended the school. The grandmother said, if your group runs into trouble four times, you will be severely punished and sent back to the plantation to work as a slave, end quote, the, the, the uh, punch card said. Okay, now a few weeks before that incident, a school in Loudoun, Loudoun County, Virginia was criticized for having students run an obstacle course intended to simulate moving through the Underground Railroad. The school said that the lesson was intended to teach teamwork and communication, adding that students were not explicitly told to think of themselves as enslaved people during the activity. Okay, but you are simulating moving through the Underground Railroad. So who the hell do you think went through the Underground Railroad? Now the Loudoun 
uh, county NAACP, on the other hand, argued that even without the instruction, the intent of the game was obvious. Given that the Underground Railroad was used to help enslaved people escape to the North, the majority of students going through the obstacle course would clearly be role playing as enslaved people. Then in February of 2019, an African American mother in South Carolina complained after she learned that her son went on a school field trip where, student, where students picked cotton while singing songs arguing that the activity was inappropriate. Now the boys school district apologized, but instructors at the trip site countered that students were learning uh, about the Great Depression, adding that students have been taken on that trip for nearly 15 years and that the trip uh, and that the trip site is an old school uh, ran by African American instructors. Uh, Fox Channel 46 in Charlotte, uh, uh, South Carolina, uh, had a uh, did a uh, posted a tweet on February 20 uh, first, 2019, about this. During African American History Month, they said a South Carolina mom says she's furious after fifth graders were told to pick cotton, sing slave song as a quote unquote game to learn about the Great Depression. Now, you should just know that having black children pick cotton is just is just something wrong with that. Okay, you, if you understand the history of African Americans, if you understand how it was England that made cotton king, and uh, it was uh, cotton, especially after the creation of the uh, cotton gin in 1793, and copies of the cotton gin, which uh, greatly lowered the production cost of cotton and made it a, a huge cash crop uh, in this country and generated billions of dollars okay for this country and it also increased the need for more uh enslaved africans to pick the cotton they say if you understand this history then you should just know that having having a, a field trip and having black children pick cotton is just is just a bad thing to do now a lot of states are struggling uh to teach the full history of slavery that struggle is having a big impact on students all right so a 2018 um, a two, let's see, social media posts from angered African-American parents and civil rights groups have brought a number of these incidents to light in recent years, but it is unclear how widespread these sorts of activities are. What is clear, though, is that these simulations fit into a larger set of difficulties uh, school systems across America have when it comes to teaching about slavery and connecting the past to current fights for racial justice. Now, in April, April 19, 2019, Vox.com had another article dealing with, uh, it was called Schools Keep Teaching Slavery and Civil Rights History in Ways That Traumatize Black Students. Schools Keep Teaching Slavery and civil rights history in ways that traumatize black students. And I talked about this in April of 2019, this specific incident. Now this took place at an Arizona charter school, okay? And what happened was, this was a reenactment of the civil rights era dealing with the Little Rock Nine who desegregated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, okay? So what happened in this incident that traumatized students once again is that uh, you had a uh, African American mother who posted on Facebook that her son, who's nine years old in the third grade, had participated in a classroom simulation in which he in which uh, he had to quote walk through his class as his teacher and fellow students yelled at humiliated and berated him during a lesson on school segregation, end quote, end quote according to the Arizona Republic, which is a, a news outlet there in Arizona. Now, the incident took place in early April 2019 at Basis Phoenix Central, B-A-S-I-S, -S, Basis, Basis Phoenix Central, which is a, a charter school for students in kindergarten through uh, fifth grade, okay? And the Arizona Republic uh, reports that the that this simulation was meant to reenact the moment when the Little Rock Nine, okay, 
um, who desegregated Central High School after uh, Supreme Court Brown versus Board of Education, 1954 Supreme Court case. This was designed to simulate when the Little Rock Nine first entered Central High School and were bombarded by slurs from white students and protesters. Now, the boy's mother, whose name is Claudia Rodriguez, explained in an April 12th, 2019 Facebook post that she only found out about the reenactment after another parent told her about it, okay? Claudia Rodriguez added that when she uh, told the school that putting her son in that position was offensive and hurtful, educators reportedly told her that, quote, there was some educational value in this incident because it started conversations in the homes of the other kids, end quote. It started conversations in the home of the other kids. Well, what about this child that's being humiliated? Quote, his humanities teacher found it wise that in order for the kids to understand what black kids during those times experience, that, that, uh, that she would have my child who was black walk through the classroom as she, another teacher, and the remaining 27 classmates yell, humiliate, and berate him, end quote. Uh, Mother Claudia Rodriguez wrote in her Facebook post. She said that the school effectively prioritized other students, quote, at the expense of my child's emotional well-being, end quote. Now, according to Phoenix ABC Channel 15, Claudia, the mother, Claudia Rodriguez, considered pulling her son from the school, but decided against it. Now, the school initially defended, the school initially defended the Little Rock Nine exercise, arguing that it had done the simulation before with no complaints. The students were not allowed to use racial slurs or derogatory language, and other parents found it to be valu a valuable lesson. Valuable lesson for who? The people being yelled, the, the student being yelled at and berated? A valuable lesson for who? For whom? Now, a school spokesperson added that Claudia Rodriguez's son volunteered for the activity. Well, yeah, he volunteered, but he probably didn't know how it was going to turn out. See, once again, this is an example. I don't understand why schools are not using this. This is free. I don't understand why schools are not using this study, Teaching Hard History, American Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Because when you read this study, and I've read it, okay, I don't have a degree in education. My degree is in business. Now, I've been studying history for 27 years. My degree is not in education. When you read it, it tells you, do not do these reenactments like this. It tells you how it harms and traumatizes students, especially African-American students. So the school initially defended the Little Rock Nine exercise, arguing that it had done the simulation before with no complaints, that students were, were not allowed to use uh, racial slurs or derogatory language, okay? And that other parents found it to be a valuable lesson. Now, a school spokesperson added that Claudia Rodriguez's son volunteered for the activity. Uh, the school spokesperson's name is Phil Handler, uh, and he told the Arizona Republic on April 15, 2019, quote, the characterization that I've heard is that the boy was fine, he was not upset, and the whole class thought it was a pretty good lesson, end quote. All right, now, the incident has thrust the Arizona school into an ongoing series of controversies involving American schools using insensitive or misguided lessons to teach students about slavery and civil rights history. Now, the lessons often encourage a shallow understanding of history and fail to help students understand how that history connects to the present. And this is one of the things that the uh, study from the Southern Poverty Law Center talks about. You have to connect the history of slavery to the history of racism and white supremacy, and then connect that to what's going on today, connect that to policies going on today, whether you're dealing with policies, dealing with immigration, whether you're dealing with attacks on African-American football players taking the knee to protest against police brutality, whether you talk about police brutality, racial injustice, racial inequities, systemic racism, understanding what racism is, racism being a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of white supremacy, the, the fight for Confederate monuments and the fight to preserve Confederate monuments. 
which were designed to largely terrorize African-Americans and keep us in a subservient position uh, in the society. All of this is interconnected and interrelated. So this is why the way the history of slavery is taught in our schools is so important. This is why the history has to be taught, as well as, of course, the history prior to slavery. Well, uh, of course, that history is extremely important. We've done with thousands of years of history. But the, the, what's it, the foundation of this country is dealing with the uh, enslavement for 246 years of African people, which, which came from the dehumanization of African people as well. So this is why it's extremely important that that history be correctly taught uh, in schools. All right. Uh, so we have Lonnie, we have William, we have Jolyn, uh, just a few of the people watching. Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. And if you like this type of information, uh, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And uh, African American business owners, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I will let you know how you can advertise uh, with the African History Network. Uh, also, uh, our current promotion uh, is running for a few more days. You get two months for the price of one. We have a new advertiser as well. We know that summer is coming up quickly. And the Fast Life 28 Day Challenge can help you get in shape. It can help you lose weight, lose inches off your waist, increase your energy, improve blood sugars and blood pressure readings, conquer food addiction and cravings. Visit their website, tfl28.com, tfl28.com. You're trying to get your sexy back. You're going to be on the beach, okay? You're going on vacation. You want to look good. Now, the 28, the Fast Life 28-Day Challenge is an online coaching program to help members tap into their body's natural ability to repair itself via fasting. In this challenge, they focus on utilizing fasting, whole foods, and movement to improve metabolic conditions such as obesity, high blood pressure, pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, fatty liver, and more. Okay, you're gonna uh, imagine what your health could look like after a 28 day after 28 days of a structured fasting regimen, healthy habits, and three coaches holding you accountable on a daily basis. They also have a uh, private Facebook group for those who are involved in this 28 day challenge. Okay, so they have a new cohort starting up soon. Uh, they have fifty dollars off the early bird discount as well. Visit their website, tfl28.com, for more information, tfl28, tfl28.com, uh, for the 28-Day uh, Fast Life Challenge. All right, so let's continue. Uh, so I want to go back. Vox.com has two articles dealing with this, and I'm going to also, also talk about the uh, article. When I first found out about this study, the first article I saw dealing with this study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's from the Atlantic.com, Atlantic.com. It came out February 1st, 2018, first day of African American History Month. And I incorporated it into uh, my presentations I was doing during, during African American History Month. And uh, this is an article entitled, What Kids Are Really Learning About Slavery? What Kids Are Really Learning About Slavery? This is from uh, the Atlantic.com. A new report finds that the topic is mistaught and often sentimentalized and students are alarmingly misinformed as a result. So this was the first article that I saw dealing with this study. I've read a number of articles uh, dealing with the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I've been keeping track of these various incidents of uh, history lessons gone wrong dealing with slavery, dealing with civil rights as well, okay? So let's go back to this article from Vox.com. Schools keep teaching slavery and civil rights history in ways that traumatize black students. All right, so um, so they talk about uh, the uh, some of the different games that have gone, uh, different examples that have gone wrong. And uh, they, uh, they, they say for Claudia Rodriguez and other critics of these kinds of classroom activities, the issue isn't really about whether the school had good intentions or not. Rather, the problem is that even, in, uh, even if other students of color are fine with the activity, exercises like the Little Rock Nine 
simulation lack nuance and force black students specifically to reenact some of the most painful moments in African American history. All right, now this is an argument that has been repeatedly made by historians, scholars, and researchers who say that student simulations on these issues are not just potentially harmful for uh, black students in the classroom, they are also ineffective and reflect a lack of cultural competency. When we look at the investigation that uh, Letitia James, Letitia James office uh, for the state of New York attorney general did dealing with what happened at the uh, chapel school there in Bronxville, New York. Okay. As I stated, they found that the, uh, they, they, they found that that exercise, that mock election, uh, uh, mock uh, slave auction, uh, profoundly hurt. It would have the uh, stated here. Just a second. It uh, the investigation found that uh, the teachers' reenactments in the two classes had a profoundly negative effect on all of the students present, especially African American students and the school community at large. Okay, so let's look at this here. All right. So this is an argument that has been repeatedly made by historians, scholars, and researchers who say that student simulations on these issues are not just potentially harmful for black students in the classroom. They're also ineffective and reflect a lack of cultural competency. So the simulations highlight a deeper problem of how schools uh, teach students about slavery and segregation. Now, a 2018 report by the Southern Poverty Law Center took a comprehensive look at these issues, surveying students and teachers across the country, reviewing popular textbooks, and looking at state standards on education about slavery to better understand how slavery uh, was being taught in schools. The researchers found that schools teach about the history of slavery and civil rights in woefully incomplete ways, woefully incomplete ways. And, and, uh, and that as a result, students can't answer basic questions about the cause of the Civil War or other related history questions. And uh, as I stated in the study, you, you know, uh, part of the study was that they surveyed uh, 1,000 high school seniors, okay, and they asked them different questions. Only 8% of high school seniors surveyed knew that the civil that that slavery was the central reason why the Civil War was fought. Only eight percent. Okay, so uh, the researchers found that the schools teach uh, about history, the history of slavery and civil rights, in woefully incomplete ways, and that as a result, students can't answer basic questions about the cause of the Civil War or other related history questions. The Southern Poverty Law Center report was especially critical of the use of simulations in the classroom, arguing that they are, quote, not shown to be effective as a, as a learning strategy. Uh, end quote, the report noted that, uh, the report noted that simulations, quote, can harm vulnerable children, can harm vulnerable children, uh, end quote, and, and that the trauma of such lessons is compounded for black students. This is what they tell you in the study. These, the, the, that these simulations can harm vulnerable students and that the trauma of such lessons is compounded for black students. This is what the attorney general's office found in New York from the slave auction. Even though Rebecca Antonozzi was not trying to harm the students, she was, she was ill-prepared to teach this lesson. She was ill-prepared by that school to teach this lesson. Okay, so. Now, instead, the report encourages schools to teach, quote unquote, hard history, a history that does not shy away from difficult discussions of racism, white supremacy, policy, and the ways historical injustices have influenced modern racial disparities. It added that schools should begin to, quote, fully integrate teachers, uh, teachings, fully integrate teachings about slavery into broader U.S. history and that the classroom, uh, God damn, R. Kelly facing 11 new sex-related charges. Damn, I'm about to do another broadcast. Okay, breaking news story. Okay. 
<laughs> this is what happens when we're live, right? I've got MSNBC on in the background. It's muted. R. Kelly facing 11 new sex related charges. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So um, instead, the report encourages students, uh, schools to teach hard history, a history that does not shy away from difficult uh, discussions of racism, white supremacy policy, and the ways historical injustices have influenced modern uh, racial disparities. It added that schools uh, should begin to fully integrate teachings about slavery into broader U.S. history and that the classroom uh, use of more historical documents can help better reflect the, quote, diverse voices, the diverse voices and experience of enslaved persons. Now, as the Arizona case uh, uh, abundantly makes clear uh, with the uh, reenactment of the Little Rock Nine, as the Arizona case abundantly uh, makes clear, many schools across the country still have not gotten the message. Quote, it's exhausting that this keeps happening over and over again, said, said Neil, Neil Lester, the director of Project Humanities at Arizona State University. Uh, and he told this to the Arizona Republic. Quote, it's beside the point whether the student volunteered or not. It should not have happened. It should have, it should have not been a lesson plan that needed to be demonstrated in the way it was, end quote, okay? So, all right, so that is an article, uh, that's part of an article I shared with you before back in April. Schools keep teaching slavery and civil rights history in ways that traumatize black students. And that's from Vox.com. Now, when we look at um, the first article that I saw dealing with the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, this, this article is from the Atlantic.com, the Atlantic.com, okay? And it's called Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. And what I'm gonna do, let's flip over here to uh, the screen share. And this is one of the things that we talk about in the new online course that I'm gonna do. Uh, it's a 16 hour, eight session online course. It starts uh, Saturday, June 8th, 2019. We'll start at, uh, I think it's gonna be about 4 p.m. Uh, it's called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School, okay? And this is a new revised, uh, this is a new revised version of this online course. The last time I taught it was uh, September of 2019. We do this online at our online school. It's not on Facebook, it's at our online school. And uh, you can watch from around the, around the world, and it's archived there. You can go back and watch it over and over again. For more information about the class, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Let me turn on the screen share here, and uh, you can see the, because uh, I have a couple of slides here, and these are some of the uh, slides we do within the online class, but I want to talk about this article from um, from the Atlantic.com, because this was the first article I saw about this study. Let's turn on the screen share and let's go to uh, let's go to this slide. How's everybody doing today? Where are we? Right here. Okay. What kids are really learning about slavery? A new report finds that the topic is, is mistaught and often sentimentalized and students are alarmingly misinformed as a result. Now this statue that you see here, this is uh, the Lincoln Emancipation Statue. It's in Washington, DC. It was erected in 1876. It was paid for by former enslaved people. And the statue has been criticized for representing the history of slavery from a paternalistic perspective. OK, uh, but very quickly here, some of the problems that they found with the way slavery is taught is that uh, uh, they teach slavery without context, preferring to present the good news before the bad. They tend to subscribe to a progressive view of American history that can that can acknowledge 
acknowledge flaws only to the extent that they have been addressed and solved, meaning not, a, not acknowledge the flaws that still exist as legacies of slavery. Um, slavery is taught about the, uh, we teach about the American enslavement of Africans as an exclusively Southern institution when all of the 13 colonies, including what would become the Northern states, had slavery as well. When you're talking about Maryland, when you're talking about, uh, there, was, there was slavery also in Michigan, even though it was, was one of the 13 colonies. Um, but New York, okay, uh, where you have Wall Street, all the 13 colonies uh, had slavery. Uh, but we rarely connect slavery to the ideology that grew up to sustain and protect white supremacy. And the ideology of white supremacy predates slavery. Now, it wasn't called white supremacy prior to the transatlantic slave trade starting right around 1440 with the Portuguese, but that ideology of European dominance, European superiority, and cultural superiority, that existed, okay? And, and white supremacy gives birth to the power structure, which is racism. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Uh, we are uh, also, we, uh, number five, we often rely on pedagogy poorly suited to the topic. Uh, uh, when we ask teachers to tell us about their favorite lesson uh, uh, when teaching about slavery, dozens proudly reported classroom simulations. See, this is, they're telling you seven key problems with the current way slavery is taught. This is right from uh, the, this is from the article from Atlantic.com, but this is from the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Student, teachers, pro, uh, dozens proudly reported classroom simulations. Wrong. Simulation of traumatic experiences is not shown to be effective as a learning strategy and can harm vulnerable children. Six, we, we rarely connect slavery to the ideology that grew up to sustain and protect white supremacy and racism. Okay, I have that in there twice for some reason, maybe because it's important. Uh, we tend to center on the white experience when we teach about slavery. It's recommended to read slave narratives. It's recommended to read slave narratives, okay? All right, so now when we look at the, um, let me close that, come out of the screen share. All right, so when we look at this article very briefly from uh, theatlantic.com, and this is the first article I saw dealing with this study, they talk about how examining the teacher's uh, survey results, because they also surveyed 1,700 social studies teachers as well. Okay. Um, let me back up a little bit. Let's look at the previous prayer paragraph. The students' results, which the report labels dismal, extend beyond factual errors to a failure to grasp key concepts underpinning the nature and legacy of slavery. Fewer than one quarter or only 22% of participating high school seniors knew that, quote, protections of slavery were embedded in American founding documents, like the U.S. Constitution, uh, end quote, that rather than a, a peculiar institution of, of the South, slavery was a constitutionally enshrined right. And fewer than four in 10 uh, students surveyed, only 39% understood how slavery, quote, shaped the fundamental beliefs of Americans about race and whiteness. So, when you have high school seniors that don't understand this basic history and all this deals with the legacy of slavery and how slavery has greatly impacted this country, maldistributed wealth, power, and resources, you're dealing with the Constitution. That's dealing with law. That's dealing with policies, okay? 30, uh, only 39% understood how slavery, quote, shaped the fundamental beliefs of Americans' race and whiteness, end quote. Well, your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. Your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. That influences who people vote for at the, at the ballot box. This influences the policies that people advocate for. This, this influences the policies that people advocate for, okay? Uh, all of this, this influences where people get their news from, like Fox News. So all of this is interconnected and interrelated. This is why the history has to be correctly taught. Now, examining the teacher's survey results, 
might help explain why students struggle to answer questions on American enslavement. Okay, and let me pull this up. Uh, let me pull this up on the computer also. How's everybody doing today? Uh, and when they have current events, I know school is out, so uh, maybe summer school or something like that. If they have uh, current events, uh, if they, they have students bring in articles for current events, bring in this article from NBC News dealing with uh, what happened in uh, with the slave auction, the mock slave auction. Okay, have kids bring in articles and talk about that. Because that's extremely important also. Okay, what are kids learning about slavery? Let's uh, look at this article here and pull it up. Okay, so examining teacher survey results might help explain why students struggle to answer questions on American enslavement. Educators are struggling themselves. Educators are not properly equipped on how to teach the history of slavery. They're not properly equipped on teaching history, period, in many cases, but especially the history of slavery. While teachers overwhelmingly, 92% claim they are comfortable discussing slavery in their classrooms, their teaching practices reveal profound lapses. Only slightly more than half, or 52% of, of, of the 1700 uh, social studies teachers surveyed, teach their students about slavery's legal roots in the nation's founding documents. Only 52% of the 1700 social studies teachers surveyed teach their students about slavery's legal roots in the nation's founding document. Well, this ties into the this ties into the whole debate over reparations. Because if you don't understand the, the slavery's legal roots in this country, then you don't understand the need for laws to correct what was done. If, if, oh, all this dealt with public policy, 246 years of slavery, decades of Jim Crow segregation, okay? The, the reallocation of hundreds of millions of acres of land, the theft of hundreds of millions of acres, acres of land, then the reallocation of that land, and African-Americans largely being locked out of that land giveaway. The Homestead Act of 1862, which redistributed about 250 million acres of land for, for, for 100 years. The Southern Homestead Act of 1866, which redistributed about 45 million acres of land in five states. The Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, which redistributed uh, uh, 138 million acres of land, okay? And, 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 and two thirds of that go to white people. Prior to all of this, going back to the 1600s and 1700s, when you deal with the head, heads right, the Head Rights Act, and white men coming to this country being given uh, uh, acres of land uh, 50 acres of land and then uh, additional acres for each slave that they own, okay? Being given this land because you're dealing with uh, British colonies and the colonies were set up to create wealth for England, okay? To establish colonies, to acquire this land, to put slaves on the land, enslaved Africans on this, on this land, produce the crops, produce products that England can sell to enrich England. Okay, so you're gonna have uh, Thomas Jefferson get free land, uh, the thousands of acres of free land. Uh, I think you got like 100,000 acres. You got George Washington has like about 70,000 acres of free land, uh, all of this, okay? So we have, to, we have to study this history. All right, and this history has to be properly taught in schools. So only slightly more than half or 52% teach their students about slavery's legal, uh, legal roots in the nation's founding documents, while just 53% uh, of teachers surveyed emphasize the extent of slavery outside of the antebellum South, okay? Talking about prior to the uh, Civil War. And 54% teach the continuing legacy of slavery in today's society. Only 54% of teachers teach the continuing legacy of slavery in today's societies. Now, Ursula Wolf Rocca, Ursula Wolf, uh, Wolf Rocca was a, uh, is a high school 
U.S. history teacher in Lake Oswego, Oregon. Okay, and uh, she was interviewed by the Atlantic, or she was interviewed in the uh, in the study. And uh, she, uh, so she's in uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, Lake, Lake Oswego, uh, Oregon, uh, which is a Portland suburb. And she has encountered students' common misconceptions, such as the belief that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, which he did not. And because that was the that was the Thirteenth Amendment was not the Emancipation Proclamation, January first, eighteen sixty three, and that the Civil War was really about states' rights, which it was not. It was fought over slavery. The South had seceded from the Union to maintain slavery to maintain their way of life. If you read their statements of secession, they talk about this. Her straightforward solution is assigning original documents. Quote: She said, "Read Lincoln's first inaugural address." and you do not find a fiery abolitionist, but someone promising to enforce the fugitive slave clause, read the articles of secession uh, from the states that seceded from the Union, starting with South Carolina, December 20th, 1860. But, uh, and, and you find striking declarations from slave states that their actions are rooted in a desire to protect slavery, end quote. She's absolutely correct. All right, so um, all right, so check out that article from uh, theatlantic.com, theatlantic.com. Okay, that is what kids are really learning about slavery. What kids are really learning about slavery, and things that they recommend in the study to um, correct the way the history of slavery is taught is let's see look here let's look at page 16. um it deals with key concepts and then there was an article from uh atlantablackstar.com that also out outlined this and outlined um uh, how to correctly teach this let's see here look at summary Okay, we have key concepts, page 16, and then I'm gonna look at the article from um, atlantablackstar.com because I can get to it quickly. So atlantablackstar.com had an article that talked about this study as well. And let's see. Was the name of that article? They lay out ten ways to uh, better teach the history of slavery. Let's see. Just a second here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Most states fail to cover ten topics recommended to. Pr uh, provide students a clear understanding of slavery. Some scored zero. This is from AtlantaBlackStar.com, February 10th, 2018. And this is about the study as well. And I thought that, um, I guess page 16 lays out the key concepts. I guess that's what that is. It lays out 10 key concepts. Yeah, this deals with, uh, so page 16 of the study lays out the key concepts and this is designed to uh help correct the way the history of slavery is taught um uh, so i'll share a few of them with you here so slavery which was practiced by europeans prior to their arrival in the americas was important to all of the colonial powers and existed in all of the european uh, uh european north american colonies and let me see, do I have this in here? Okay, that's the Southern. All right. Uh, number two, slavery and the slave trade were central to the development and growth of the economy across British North America and later the United States. Three, protections for slavery were embedded in the founding documents. Enslavers dominated uh, the federal government, Supreme Court, 
in U.S. Senate from 1787 to 1860. Okay, and that's a long that's a long time actually to do that. And let me pull it up here. I have the study here, so let's look at it. Uh, page 16 here in the study. Uh, number four, slavery was an institution of power. Slavery was an institution of power designed to create a uh, profit for the enslavers and uh, break the wheel, break the wheel of the enslaved and was a relentless quest for profit uh, abetted by racism. Okay, let's look at uh, page 16. Okay. All right. So number five, enslaved people resisted the efforts of their enslavers to reduce them to commodities in both revolutionary and everyday ways. Number six, so this contradicts that whole theory that slavery was a choice. Number six, the experience of slavery um, varied depending on time, location, crop, labor performed, size of slave holding, and gender, which is true. The history of slavery is a very nuanced history. So you have to understand which part of the country you were talking about, what period of time are you talking about, whether it's a large plantation, small plantation. It's a very nuanced history. Uh, number seven, slavery was the central cause of the Civil War. Number eight, slavery shaped the fundamental beliefs of Americans about race and whiteness, and white supremacy was both a product and legacy of slavery. Um, now, I, I, I disagree with that. The, the ideology of white supremacy, even though it was not called white supremacy early on, that ideology predated the system of slavery, gave birth to it, and that ideology we see it is, is this is why you have to understand the history of the Africans known as the Moors. Because the, the Moors are starting to be dehumanized, we see going back to about the 12th or 13th century. Okay, and this is going, the, the way that the Moors uh, are looked at and perceived and talked about begins to change. And we see them being dehumanized. The, the dehumanization of African people didn't start with the transatlantic slave trade. It goes back prior to that. And it goes back, it goes back to the, the relationship between the Africans known as the Moors who go into the Iberian Peninsula in 711 AD, today known as Spain and Portugal. They go all throughout Europe. They take the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe, and it brings Europe out of the Dark Ages. And this is some of the history that I, that I want to deal with in the online course that I teach. Um, Dealing with ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And this is uh, the uh, 2000, 2019 edition, okay? 2019 edition. This is some of the things that I'm going to deal with in the class. All right. But these teachings are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. They're going to lead to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. They lead to Christopher Columbus setting sail on his first of four voyages, August 3rd, 1492. Okay, uh, so slavery shaped the fundamental beliefs of Americans about race and whiteness. Uh, number nine, enslaved and free people of African descent had a profound impact on American culture, producing leaders and literary, artistic, and folk traditions, traditions that continue to influence the nation. And number 10, by knowing how to read and interpret the sources that tell the story of American slavery, we gain insight into some of what enslaving, enslaving and enslaved Americans aspire to, created thought and desire. Okay, so that's from page 16 of uh, the uh, study, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. How's everybody doing? How's Latoya, Wesley, uh, and Toya? Uh, how are you all doing? If you want more information about the online course that we have starting up uh, June 8th, 2019, email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, also, uh, we'll have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So this is a um, updated version of the online course I last taught September 2017. It's been a lot of 
There's been a lot of discoveries that have come out since then, archaeological discoveries, et cetera. So we'll deal with a lot of that in the online course, okay? It's a uh, eight session, 14 hour online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And you can watch from around the world. It'll be archived, watch over and over again also. All right, let me, do, let me deal uh, with a little bit of what we'll cover in the online course. If you've taken the course before, you'll be able to register for this one at a 50% discount as well. So this class will be $80. It's a 16 hour online course. I teach it. We have uh, numerous book references, the uh, book sources, about 50 articles. We'll cover thousands of years of history. You don't have to read any of these books to be able to follow along in the class, but I'm using it for reference. All right, let's, uh, let's look at some of these slides. I do a PowerPoint presentation as well. These are some of the slides from the uh, actual class. We'll talk some about the film Black Panther as well uh, in the course also, because that ties in the African history uh, also. But here's some of the things that, we, that, I, that I deal with in an online course. Let's see, go to slide 17. All right, so we do a what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting. I approach this chronologically as opposed to episodically. The transatlantic slave trade was not an episode in history that just popped out of the thin air. Thin air. It was the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead up to this taking place. Uh, what role did Christopher Columbus play? Columbus is central to the transatlantic slave trade spreading. Okay, Columbus is central to the spread of the transatlantic slave trade, even though it did not start with Columbus. When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? So, you know, this year we're celebrating, a lot of people celebrating August 20th, 1619. And they say this is when African people first came to this country as slaves, or some say this is when we first came to this country. Uh, both are wrong. Number one, we've been in this land that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. And if you read the book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel, which is one of the sources for the course, one of the books I use in the course, the, Dr. David M. Hotel thoroughly documents that history, okay? Uh, African people have been in this land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years. These were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa. They go uh, all around the world. And they were in this land as well, okay? And they're building the, uh, the, these were the early mound builders. They're building mounds up and down the Mississippi River. There were about a million mounds in this land we call the United States. Today, there are only about 100,000. The largest one that's still there is called Cahokia, which is in um, East Illinois, Cahokia, okay? But this is, this is our history. So we can't, deal with the transatlantic slave trade in 1440 or 15th century. We have to deal with thousands of years of history prior to that. All right, so let's continue here. Um, so when the slaves first come to the U.S., so August 20, 16, 19, 19, Jamestown, Virginia did happen. At that time, slave statutes did not even exist in the 13 colonies. The first slave statute does not come until 1641. That's in Massachusetts. This is one of the things we'll deal with in the class. The, the understanding of the history of slavery is a very nuanced history. The Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina going back to um, the 1520s, specifically 1526. And you have Moors who were being kicked out of uh, Spain, who were being enslaved by the Spanish, taken into Spanish territories like Florida and South Carolina. So even though the transatlantic slave trade did happen, but you have some African Moors who are being enslaved and taken in, in, and brought to this country as well. The Spanish territories, okay? It's a different history than the, it's a different government, the Spanish territories under a different government than the English colonies, okay? Those are different, it's a different history. Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? So we'll deal with that complicated history because it's not, it didn't exactly happen the way oftentimes it's, the history is told. Were African people in America before the slave trade? Absolutely. This was our land stolen from us and it's been stolen numerous times. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. And there's some new discoveries that we have to talk about. 
insurance companies that uh, took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations, um, Freemasonry America and the Founding Fathers, Origins of the Term Africa and America, that's Renoko Rashidi there who referenced some of his books in the class. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Malcolm X, uh, the media, he said, Mal Malcolm said the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and the guilty innocent, and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. Let me see, I'm trying to stop the screen share. All right. Okay. So these are just uh, some of the things that we deal with in the uh, online course. Let's bring the screen share back up. All right, so this is Dr. David M. Hotep and his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, which came out in 2011. His book documents, uh, his book has 713 footnotes, thoroughly documents an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. Uh, on page 14 of his book, he deals with a discovery by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. Uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear made a discovery in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004. 2004. 15 years ago. And uh, they found 13 different pieces of evidence, 13 different types of evidence that thoroughly documented African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174 dehaploids, uh, dehaploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. Now, his new book comes out July 2019. If everything goes right, I talked to him about two or three weeks ago. His new book is called The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. The First Americans Were Africans Revisited has about 200 additional pages. He has a lot more um, information, new research uh, in the book. So it's going to be deep. It's going to blow people away. This is Dr. Alba Goodyear, archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. This is an article from 2004, November 18, 2004, from ScienceDaily.com that talks about his discovery. Uh, it's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Okay. And this is a, uh, here's a synopsis. Here's a summary of his uh, discovery. This is the summary from ScienceDaily.com. A radiocarbon test of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina uh, archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay, now this article is still there. You can go read it, read it uh, now, sciencedaily.com. Okay, so see, these are some of the things that we deal with, some of the archaeological discoveries, things like this. This is a discovery that was made and uh, was, it was revealed in 2013. They actually made the discovery about 13 years before that. This is the lost city of Egypt called Tanis Heraklion, which was lost about 1200 years ago. It was swallowed into the sea and uh, it was believed to be built around eighth century BC. Uh, these are some of the discoveries they made at the bottom of the sea, uh, 16 foot tall statues, uh, statue of Osset or Isis. Uh, they found, uh, they found 64 ships that were buried uh, 150 feet uh, beneath the sea, 16 foot tall statues, uh, 700 anchors. It was a huge discovery. I talked about it then, uh, back then when it was revealed back in 2013. So we deal with uh, a lot of archeological discoveries and, and deal with history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. We have to talk about the history of the Moors who lose control of their last stronghold, Granada, January 2nd, 1492. The Moors are taking the teachings of ancient Kemet into Europe. The teachings uh, uh, and, and these teachings are going to be taught to Europeans. And uh, a watered down version of these teachings are make up Freemasonry, form the foundation of Freemasonry. When we look at a lot of symbols that we see in Europe, even symbols here in the US, they have an African root or they come from Africa, this African symbology. When we look at the Washington Monument, Washington Monument, 555 feet tall. Tony Browder talks about this in Egypt on the Potomac. That's one of the books we use in the class as well. 
Um, the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol called a Tekken or an obelisk, which comes from the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And there were about 1,200 Tekken Nu all throughout Europe today, uh, all throughout Kemet, ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt. Today, there are only about 12 left. They've been taken to other parts of the world or destroyed, taken to places like Istanbul, Turkey, and Vatican City, Paris, France, etc. But when we look at the word Mason, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. And Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light, because we taught women as well, we didn't discriminate, was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. And many other Masonic temples were modeled after temples uh, of ancient Kemet, places where light and knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees, steps or degrees. Read pages 18 and 32 of uh, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. So when we look at you going to college and getting your credentials in a series of degrees, that comes out of ancient Kemet. When we look at the seven liberal arts, that they originate in ancient Kemet, okay, in the, in the schools they were with the mystery system were taught. Um, George G. and James talks about this in Stolen Legacy. He talks about the, the trivium and the quadrivium, the three and the four. He talks about the seven liberal arts. Um, so historically, light was associated with knowledge. When we look at um, the description here, historically, light was associated with knowledge, okay? So when we talk about Europe being in the dark ages, it's a, it's, it's a period of time of hundreds of years of ignorance lack of enlightenment. And then when we look at, it's the Moors that bring Europe out of the dark ages, that next age going into basically like the 15th century, uh, late 1400s, early 1500s, or you know, going into uh, actually the 16th century, but uh, late 1400s, uh, 15th century, and going into the 16th century, that period of time is called the Renaissance age, a time of, en a time of enlightenment, light, a time of enlightenment going into the age of knowledge, the Renaissance. So um, they talk about how you had uh, the, child, the child of light and sons of daughters of light. Why? Because light was associated with knowledge, okay? And when you look at, say, cartoons, even today, if you have a cartoon character, whether it's Doc McStuffins or Mickey Mouse or Dora the Explorer, they get a bright idea, a light bulb goes off over their head, light associated with knowledge. When you have a child that is said to be a dim-witted child, D-I-M, lack of light, meaning unintelligent or dumb or what have you. Okay, so, uh, and then 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. So when we see the layout of Washington, D.C., we see the layout of Washington, D.C. is based upon ancient African principles, right? And the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of ancient Egypt. We know Benjamin Banneker was the surveyor who did the layout of Washington, D.C. But Browder talks about in Egypt on the Potomac, he shows you how the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of ancient Egypt, the layout of ancient Egypt. And we know 13 of the 13 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons also. Okay, so here's uh, Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks call uh, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Asar is in the middle. Okay, and we see uh, Aset, who the Greeks called Isis with the, with the horns and the sun disk. Okay, this is ancient African history. And we see that Aset was copied, culturally appropriated by DC Comics in the 1970s TV show called The Secrets of Isis, where they depicted this white woman as being Isis. If you watch the show, last time, uh, a few years ago, I know they had episodes on Hulu, the streaming service Hulu. They talk about in the beginning of the show how she gets her powers from ancient Egypt, but she, she's a white woman. And they didn't tell you that the ancient Egyptians were African people, that Aset or Isis was an African woman, okay, in the story, in the mythology. And then we see from, and, and so we see Europeans were worshiping the Black Madonna and Child for hundreds of years. The Black Madonna and Child, which comes from Aset and Heru. And then 
from the black Madonna and child, as you have a rise in white supremacy and a rise in the European phenotype, then you're going to have the decolorized version promoted. Okay, but they still have uh, statues of the black Madonna and child all throughout Europe uh, today. That still exists. Okay, we have uh, Dr. Francis Cress Wells and Nelly Fuller as well. Uh, I'm trying to get to, uh, trying to find these. Uh, let me see if there are any other slides I need to get to. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is one, this is one I wanted to show you. So when we deal with, um, very quickly here, and I was talking about the Moors, when we look at, uh, for instance, the impact that the Moors had on Europeans, these are the, the national flags of um, the islands, the French island of Corsica uh, with the blue background and the Italian island in the Mediterranean of Sardinia. They have Moors heads on their flags right now, okay? Because the Moors were in those areas, took a monumental effort to conquer them. And originally, the, the, you, you see they're wearing bandanas. Originally, these bandanas were blindfolds that symbolized that they were prisoners. But because of tourism and being politically correct, they turned the bandanas, they turned the blindfolds into bandanas. But, uh, you know, I first saw this in a Renoko Rashidi's book, um, his book, Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe, okay? And this is one of the books that I, I reference in the class also. Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe from uh, Renoko Rashidi. I've written a few Renoko a number of times. And I, I saw, I was preparing for an interview that I was doing with them about this book. Uh, this was back in like 2011, 2012. And I saw the, um, I, I saw he had those pictures of the flags in his book. So I started doing research on it. And I'm like, whoa, I said, this is deep. Now, I, I had already read Golden Age of the Moor. So I was familiar with a lot of this. And, and Renoko has a uh, essay in uh, the book Golden Age of the Moor as well, which is one of the best books dealing with the, uh, the history of the Moors during medieval time. But he shows you, um, he shows you those flags in this book also. Okay, I'm just trying to see what. Find it. I thought I had it bookmarked, but this is a—I mean, this is a really deep book here. Uh, Black Star: The African Presence in Early Europe. Okay, I guess I can't. Let's see, that's the Herald Week. But here are some of the images of the black the statues of the Black Madonna and Child that are still in Europe today. Okay, and this right here is the flag of uh, Sardinia. This is the flag of Sardinia, uh, flag of Sardinia, Italy, with four Moors heads. All right, this is from pages ninety and ninety-one of um, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe by Renoko Rashidi. Visit his website, Renoko, Dr. Renoko .com, Dr. Renoko .com. Visit his website um, because I think you can order his books there. I know he does tours of different countries in Africa as well, so check him out for that also. Okay, and then when we look at Christopher Columbus, uh, like I said, it's, it's really important to study Columbus because uh, Columbus helps to spread the uh, Col Columbus helps with the spread of the the transatlantic slave trade and the spread of white supremacy and racism slavery capitalism exploitation columbus helps to really lay the foundation for uh racism capitalism exploitation of indigenous people helps to spread slavery but what, one of the things that's important to understand about columbus is that he never came to the land that we call the united states of america Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest Columbus comes here is uh, Cuba, which is 90 miles away, okay? So when we look at his first voyage, he set sail August 3rd, 1492 on the Nina, the Penta, and the Santa Maria. Uh, and he goes to the Bahamas, which he calls San Salvador. San Salvador. He goes to Cuba and Hispaniola. You know, Hispaniola becomes Haiti. 
Um, his second voyage, September 1493, he goes into West Indies and it goes into what we call Puerto Rico or Boricuan, goes into Jamaica in 1494. His third voyage, May of 1498, goes into Trinidad and Venezuela and he goes into South America a little bit. His fourth voyage, May of 1504, he goes to the Panama and Honduras in Central America. He never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. Now, as Dr. David M. Hotep talks about in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence, 70%, at least 70% of the people Columbus encountered on his four voyages were African people, at least 70%. Okay, so uh, this is a very, very deep history. All right, who do we have here? How's everybody doing? So uh, email us at customerservice at africanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. We'll give you the information for the uh, online course we have starting up. And uh, we'll have the information also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, right on the home page. Okay, that website I was talking about was drrenoco.com. Dr. R U N O K O, drrenoco.com. I misspelled it. Yeah, we'll post it here, drrenoco.com, okay? And then also email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Um, we'll let you know, we'll give you the information about uh, registering for the online course that, that, I, that I'm teaching starting up June 8th, uh, 2019. It's an eight-week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Mahafa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach in school, this class will be live and it'll be archived. So if you miss any of it, you can go back and watch it over and over again. Yeah, Renoko is on Facebook. We're Facebook friends. Uh, just search for Renoko Rashidi, R-U-N-O-K-O, uh, R-U-N-O-K-O, R-A-S-H-I-D-I, Renoko Rashidi. Uh, search for him on Facebook. And he has a fan page. He has like 100,000 followers, um, uh, his Facebook fan page. All right. Okay, so if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, uh, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show that helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, finance our Sunday night show as well. Um, uh, 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 paypal.me forward slash the AHN show or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Be sure to listen to uh, uh, Sunday show. We're on every Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we broadcast on 9, 10 a.m. The, super, the Superstation, WFDF in Detroit. We broadcast on Facebook Live also. This show is going to be fantastic, so you don't want to miss that as well. And uh, we'll continue our coverage dealing with uh, impeachment, impeachment of Trump, what is impeachment, uh, why he should be impeached, things like this. We'll deal with some other stories also. All right, so let me uh, see if there's anything else. I think I got, I think I got everything. But once again, this uh, this talks about it, when we deal with the stories um, dealing with slave lessons, history lessons gone wrong in school, we have to understand how this traumatizes African American students. So we talked about uh, black students depicted as slaves in mock slave auction. State investigation finds ha had a profoundly negative effect on all the students, especially African American students. So this is why. The history of slavery has to be correctly taught in schools across the country. This is why um, this study here from the Southern Poverty Law Center, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery, is so important, okay? And you can download this from uh, splcenter.org, Southern Poverty Law Center's website, splcenter.org. And also the online course that I teach, uh, this is why this is so important. And, and you can, the uh, students, children can, uh, watch the online course also so it's not vulgar i don't do i don't curse it's not vulgar uh it's not um, overly graphic with horrific details uh, you know things like that we, you know we deal with talk about slavery some but it's not um horrifically graphic okay also so it's suitable for us uh, 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 children and teenagers all right. Okay. Look, 
Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. We have to get out of here. Uh, follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P on YouTube. Uh, subscribe there and also uh, click on the bell so you're notified when we go live, when we upload new videos. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Turn on notifications there as well. And uh, remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself. And what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Remember, right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. I'll talk to you next time. Peace.